Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, where filmmakers become entrepreneurs. With my dad, he's a dork. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Film Trooper Presents Film Marketing Fridays. And today's episode is sponsored by the new book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It's available in paperback, ebook, and an audiobook. And in fact, you can actually get the audiobook for free when you sign up for a 30 day trial with audible.com. All you have to do is go to survivetheimplosion.com. Again, that's survivetheimplosion.com. Today's episode, we are going to focus on what are the three biggest pains for filmmakers and how to fix them. Hi there, I'm your host, Scott McMahon. I'm a fellow film trooper over at filmtrooper.com where we try to help filmmakers become entrepreneurs. And not only is this a Film Marketing Friday uh, video session, but it also turns into a podcast, an audio podcast. And this happens to be the 100th episode of the Film Trooper podcast. So it's a little bit of a milestone. And in order to celebrate all this um, festivities, as you can see, there's quite a bit of party behind me. (laughs) So I wanted to make sure that this episode was all about the Film Trooper community. And what I did was send out a survey And a lot of you took the time to answer a very simple survey, but I got a chance to get an idea of what your struggles were. And from that data, um, I'm able to put the show together and highlight to you the three overall arching pains that filmmakers are going through right now outside of money. (laughs) Because it seems like money could, you know, solve all this stuff. But because we're independent filmmakers and we're poor and that's why we're here, Um, We can at least try to uh, uh, tackle these pain points um, the best we can uh, with the available resources in front of us. So let's just get on with it. Um, Here are the three biggest pains that filmmakers go through other than money, and they are time. Never feel like you have enough time to make your dreams come true. Number two is fan base. How do I create a fan base or build a fan base when I don't have one to start with? And number three is good people, (laughs) finding good people, basically finding a network of good people or a really good crew that is there to help fulfill your dream and not stab you in the back. So these are the three major pain points that I discovered or uncovered in the survey. So let's just get on with the first one, which is time. First thing we need to accept is that time is constant. So how do you wrestle with something that would always be, you know, constant? It is what it is. It's constant. Well, interesting enough, Da Vinci, Einstein, Spielberg, well, they all shared the same 24 hours that we do. You know, of course, yes, they might have different access to resources and money, but they can't manage time any better than we can because time is unmanageable. So if you can't manage time, then what are you really managing? Well, you manage the psychology of time. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but you yes, you manage the psychology of time. A friend of mine, uh, Mike Vardy, over at the Productivityist Weekly, um, did this TED Talk. And in his TED Talk, he, he mentioned that when you're in Vegas and you're in the casinos, what's the one thing that's missing? Clocks, right? There's no clocks anywhere. Because the casinos don't want their patrons to know what time it is. They want their customers to focus on the task. And that task might be losing money (laughs) or maybe just maybe winning a little bit of money. Another expert who really coined this concept of the psychology of time is David Allen, author of Getting Things Done. I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, creatives need to have the time and space to be messy. So there you are. We are creatives. So allow ourselves to be messy in terms of the creative process, but we have to make sure we have enough time and space to make that happen. If you want to listen to a great interview with David Allen, check out my friends uh, Jason Buff's podcast over at Indie Film Academy, podcast number 27. Um, It's really, really well done because it goes into like the screenwriting process, but um, uh, Jason was able to pull a lot of information out of David Allen. So definitely check it out. Indie Film Academy, Podcast number 27. Anyway, getting back to the psychology of time, we can assess that we need to not focus on time. So that's not what we need to focus on. And we actually need to focus on a task or the task. And we have to allow creativity to be messy, as well as give yourself the psychological space. 
So we're really focusing on space and not necessarily time. As the above uh, bullet point shows, we're also focusing on task. So task and space. Well, then how do you manage the psychology of your space? I tend to look at the term space as like getting into the zone, you know, the zone. I think we've all been in a zone of one sort or the another, right? I mean, we might be writing a script and you're just, you know, cranking away and not knowing where time is going. Uh, you might be, you know, recording a piece of music or, you, you know, if you're a young kid, you're outside, you know, playing until it got dark. Like whatever task or thing that you were so into that you didn't worry about time. You weren't checking the time. You were just so involved with your task. And that's like the place we're all fighting to be in all the time, which is the zone, just getting into the zone. So let's get into the zone. All the experts suggest that every night before you go to bed or on the very first thing you do in the morning is to do a brain dump. I know it sounds disgusting, but you know, it's what it's called. It's a, a brain dump. I mean, if you're doing one kind of dump in the morning, you're probably doing another dump, which you can do with your brain. The idea here is that whatever's in your brain, all those thoughts, you want to get down on paper or on a computer. You're essentially taking this massive amount of data and making it tangible, putting it into another format that is physical, that it's tangible, that you can work with at that point. So what do you do with the tangible assets once you're finished with them? Well, the experts recommend that you gather everything into buckets or folders. This gathering process is very well known to the world of like time management experts. So, you know, we have something tangible now. Now we can start organizing it and putting into certain buckets or folders. That's our gathering points. Once you have these thoughts converted into tangible data and you put them into buckets or folders, then we're supposed to apply the four D's. And what are the four D's? You take each task and you decide to either do it right then, delegate it to someone else to do it, defer the task to a later time. This is like a conscious procrastinating process. Or you take that task and delete it. You get rid of it. Now with each task, we're supposed to schedule it on a calendar. So if we look at our calendar schedule, here are some practical tips from the experts that recommend that if we have a task to be completed in five minutes or less, then we should do it. So if something is supposed to take five minutes or less, then then just do it. But if it's more than 15 minutes, like if you look at your things to do list or your brain dump, you know, tangible data uh, spreadsheet and say, oh my gosh, this task can take me more than 15 minutes, then you're supposed to schedule it. And then definitely pad in for the intangibles. Basically, everything that can go wrong during your day or things you're not planning for will happen. So allow yourself time and space to be able to handle those things. Those things might be like errands or things you might have to like, um, you know, take your kid to school or take care of a, a sick, you know, parent or something like that. These types of things are just in your life that you might as well sort of plan for it a little bit as much as you can. Then ideally, you want a batch process. And this lends to the concept that multitasking doesn't work. The reason that the experts conclude that multitasking doesn't work is that it's different than like backgrounding. If you know you've ever you know done like editing and you have music in the background or you're listening to a podcast, maybe you're listening to me. <laughs> That's sort of like background, you know, um, processing. You're not necessarily doing the task; you're just acquiring the information in a different uh, capacity. Uh, so backgrounding or uh, you know multitasking sometimes is called switch tasking. So this is a really funny uh, example what the experts say to do to you know test out whether or not multitasking actually works. So on a you know a piece of paper you're supposed to write in one line, I am a great multitasker. Then on the second line you're supposed to write out the numbers zero through twenty. Now, I was supposed to let you know that when you're doing this, you're supposed to time yourself. How long did it take you to write both lines? You know, the first line and the second line. Now, in order to test out this multitasking theory, you're supposed to do the same thing, but you're supposed to, on the second go around while you're timing yourself, is to write in the I and then go to 
like zero, then go back to A, then go back to one and so on. Just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Because you're literally uh, switching up your tasks, you know, writing, uh, you know, words versus numbers. So if we do that right now, we can see how much longer that's going to take me. This is why the experts conclude that multitasking doesn't work. Now, the interesting thing is, as filmmakers, we do this all the time with our own films. So why not apply it to our lives? On a film, we take our scripts and we have to fill out a breakdown sheet, you know, a script breakdown sheet. So every little item in each scene is cataloged and categorized in sections such as cast, special effects, wardrobe, stunts, you know, props, vehicles, sound effects, makeup, hair, all that kind of stuff is categorized. It's, this is our version of the brain dump. Then we take these breakdown sheets and make them into a strip board for scheduling. So at this stage, we can determine what our shooting days will look like. Then each day has its own shot list. So you can see in the world of filmmaking, we already organize our creative work in such a manner in order to have a successful shoot. You know what looks like a film schedule board or a strip board? A calendar. Now this is a calendar from a college student uh, as an example of time management. But you can see if you can schedule out your days like this, you are essentially taking what you do already in the film world and applying to your real life in order to manage your time or manage your space or to help you get into the zone. Now I've gone back and forth trying to use these techniques. You know, sometimes I'm successful for a couple weeks and then I then I just fall off the wagon, you know? <laughs> it's like, oh man, I just need to just focus on one thing. So there's a great little saying, just so you can remember, if you're just more creative and you don't want to get so bogged down about calendars, then just remember the word focus, which is follow one course until successful. So push everything out of the way and just be single-minded about one thing until it's successful, one task until it's successful. And this quote and concept comes from Robert Kiyosaki, author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So again, focus, which means follow one course until successful. Let's get into the second burning question from the Film Trooper survey, which revolves around fan base. And the question is, how do you build a fan base when you have none? Well, the cool thing about building a fan base is that you get to pick who you want to be as your fans. And this frame from uh, Disney's Lady and the Tramp reminds us that we're looking for fans who will love what we do, who will fall in love with us possibly, but hopefully what, what we do and what we stand for. So in the end, we're really building our ideal fan. Now, some of you who've been following me on Film Paper for a while may have already gone through this checklist or seen previous episodes where I talk about the ideal fan. And the checklist in a PDF uh, format is available for download um, in the show notes. And the show notes are available at filmtrooper.com forward slash 100 because this is the 100th episode. So quickly going through the checklist, these are the types of questions that you want to ask yourself about the fan base you want to serve. And why I bring that up is because I meet a lot of filmmakers sometimes that are just making a film's uh, their films and they're trying to make a film just to make a film and they're not necessarily all that jazzed about the audience that it's for which is difficult because if as the uber independent filmmaker we're probably not going to have a huge following of you know millions of people we may only have a few hundred to a few thousand and because of that we need to really love who we're dealing with on a regular basis and this ideal fan checklist allows us that opportunity to discover um, who we really should be targeting. So with that said, let's jump into the questionnaire. So the ideal fan checklist questionnaire, the first question you would ask yourself is, number one, who do you dream of hanging out with? Number two, what sort of people do you aspire to be friends with? And number three, who would you like to hang out with on a daily basis? Number four, would you want these ideal friends to become ideal fans? Number five, how old are they? Number six, are they men, women, or children? Number seven, what country do they come from? Number eight, what city do they live in? Number nine, how much money do they make? Number 10, 
What is their socioeconomic background? Number 11. What movies do they like? Number 12. How do they like to watch movies? Number 13. What music do they like? Number 14. How do they like to listen to music? Number 15. What do they read? Books, magazines, blogs? And how do they like to read those publications? Number 16. Who are their friends? Number 17. What are their values? Number 18. What do they like to spend their money on? Number 19. What does their daily routine look like? Number 20. What do they never leave the house without bringing with them? 21. What are their fears? Number 22. What are their desires? Number 23. What keeps them awake at night? Number 24. What are they worried about? Number 25. What do they dream about? Number 26. What do they aspire to become? And number 27. How can your film product fulfill these dreams? As you can see, going through this checklist really allows you to get into the nitty gritty of who your ideal fan really is. And it's not like a demographic, which is like men between 18 and 25. You know, obviously that doesn't even account for that. That's like one question in this questionnaire. It's deeper than that. You're trying to connect with people on an emotional level so that your marketing messages, that your uh, the materials that you create all respond very well to this ideal fan. So that's why it's so in depth. And the interesting thing is that if you were to hire a, a marketing firm, these are the types of questionnaires they would ask themselves if you had a product that you're trying to sell to you know different marketplaces. You know they were they would try to figure out like well who was our customer, and th these this checklist essentially comes from the marketing world of how they would handle that for clients. So you can just do it on your own. And so again, get the ideal fan checklist. It's a PDF download on uh, filmtrooper.com forward slash one hundred, and you can get it there for free. So what do you do with all this information once it's written down, once you have your ideal fan, you know, you know, fleshed out? You're like, oh, that's who I need to be hanging out with. That's who I need to sell my stuff to. Well, there's a marketing proverb that says, if you want to be a leader, find the parade and jump in front of it. The parade you're looking for is the communities where your ideal fans are already hanging out at. So how do you jump in front of the parade? Value. The marketing experts that I follow tend to agree that you need to add value to the conversation that is already happening. That's how you jump in front of the parade. Let's go through a really simple example. Say you're on Facebook and you have a movie that you're making that deals with ghosts and paranormal. So just go into like Facebook in the search bar and type in ghosts paranormal. And then you need to kind of scroll down to the, you know, the, the drop down menu to the right side where it says groups. So hit groups. So here we're seeing people that um, are all interested in, the, you know, the key phrases or the keywords of ghosts and paranormal. A lot of these groups are closed. All you need to do is ask to join and somebody will let you, you know, come in on one of those. You can see how many members are in each group. There's up to almost 30,000 members in this one particular group. And um, if I scroll down, there was one that was really interesting to me. It was so specific and so niche. It was um, the Gettysburg Ghost Paranormal Investigation. This is a public group with a little over a thousand people. So if I click this group, you know, there's an active participants in here that are all interested in the concept of discovering ghosts from the Gettysburg Civil War event. And, um, you know, so what you do is you join one of these groups and you're just taking the time to read the posts and comments that people are making. You're getting a better idea is like asking yourself, are these my ideal fans? Are, what are they into? What, what makes them tick? Especially if I'm making a film about Gettysburg's ghost or something like that. So it's really cool, you know, because you can just sit here and not do anything other than read and absorb and make uh, make notes and maybe you know add a comment and this is a one way of adding value is like somebody posts something and then you like it share it or make a comment on it so when you're comfortable enough and you've gotten to know members of the group then you can start posting stuff of your own 
So like, say this is about, you know, Gettysburg ghosts. And um, I've got this still pick that I grabbed from the internet that deals with uh, Ken Burns' um, classic Civil War documentary on PBS many, many years ago. It's like, whatever, 15 hours or plus 30 hours, how long the thing is. So I can grab this, you know, still frame or this, this visual and put a post up in that group. And when I put a post up in that group, I can just make a comment like, I'm getting excited to start watching, I've never seen it before, Ken Burns' Civil War. And um, anything I should look out for in terms of relationships to the story of Gettysburg and my visit to Gettysburg or whatever it might be. And you're not even talking about your film. You're just making, you're just becoming a good community member. You're becoming a, a good participant. And by just throwing up like pictures like this, you're allowing others in the community to engage with you or engage with the posts that you're creating. Eventually you want to create content that's going to take them away from the group and onto your blog or onto your website. So the content actually resides there on your website. So they might read it or watch the video, but it's all connected to your blog. And then at the end of your blog post or your video, you have to have some sort of call to action that gets them onto your email list. Because once they're on your email list, that is where you get to develop the relationship further. That's when you really get to see who your true fans are. It's too fleeting in the world of social media. People can come and go. There's not a lot of loyalty sometimes. But with somebody who's committing to be on your email list, that's a much better place to eventually sell your product, which is your film and everything else that's related to your film. So that's the strategy of jumping in front of a parade. You're finding communities, you're finding influencers, people that are bigger bloggers or podcasters or people on YouTube that have a huge audience that you want to get in front of. Engage with that community first in the comment sections, you know, add value by creating content, you know, as simple as a, a still frame or some videos and eventually you know, earn that goodwill that'll bring you back to their, your website and your email list. And that's how you build a fan base when you don't have one. So a recap of adding value. You add value to the conversation already happening and you make sure that you add a call to action. And the call to action is to get them on your email list because that's when you sell. You sell on your email list, not on social media. It's very rare do you see somebody putting a post up on Facebook that says, hey, buy this. <laughs> I mean, you might see ads and stuff like that, but we're not there. Or mentally, we're not there to buy anything. We're mentally to buy something if we're on Amazon, but to help somebody get over to Amazon, you want to use your email list to direct them to your movie, either on iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo, wherever it might be. Okay, now let's move on to the third and last burning question from the Film Trooper survey, and that is about good people. How do you find the good people? Meaning, how do you find a network of talented people who don't suck and who won't stab you in the back? It's very specific, isn't it? <laughs> so it's important to understand that all people are inherently driven by incentives. And this comes from the authors of Freakonomics, the book Freakonomics. Uh, we're all emotional beings and we're all driven by incentive. So it's important to understand what that incentive is. Another way to look at it is motivation. And in the business world, companies have to look at ways to continually motivate their employees. So according to the experts, here are some key factors when it comes to motivating anybody. Number one is appreciation or respect. Uh, some Companies or consultants use the term respect. Others use appreciation, but it's pretty much the same thing. People are motivated by being respected and being appreciated. And there's also belonging and purpose. So the next thing you want to do when you're building your team is to make sure the purpose is meaningful and that your team feels like they belong to something that is meaningful. And the third thing is growth and development. Is there an opportunity with your film project that allows your team to grow individually? There has to be some sort of incentive there for them to want to contribute to your film, especially if you don't have any money. <laughs> and then you want to celebrate wins. Anything that your team does, you're always 
obviously appreciating them, but you want to show it. You can't just say, good job. If you actually physically do something that shows that you have skin in the game in terms of appreciating them, these little wins that you celebrate mean a lot to the people that are working for you. And then definitely have clear communications related to the purpose. So your team is made up of like four types of people. You have the willingness and skilled. That's like your top type person that you want on your team. Then there's sometimes you're going to find a lot of people that are willing but don't have the skills. And the worst kind are if they have no willingness but they do have the skills. And really, really the worst kind is if they have no willingness and no skills. So what you're really trying to focus on is get rid of the bottom two and just focus on building a team of the top two, which is anyone who's willing and has the skills or no skills. Because it's very difficult to try to motivate somebody who is not motivated themselves, even if you apply those tactics or uh, recommendations of the, the previous slide. And here's a good rule of thumb when trying to get rid of someone that has no willingness. is to hire slow, but fire fast. One thing you can do is if you've assembled a team, maybe try to enter a 48-hour film festival together. Because within 48 hours, you're going to see who steps up and who doesn't step up. And you won't waste like, you know, months or weeks, you know, making your film with the wrong type of people. You might be able to accumulate a team uh, very, of very good people within one of those 48-hour uh, film competitions. It's sort of a, yeah, it's just a good testing ground of like, hmm, let me see who, who I can work with or who I can't work with. And how do you do this when you have no money? Well, let's take a look at this. If we know that what motivates people is respect and appreciation, then if we don't have any money, then we must appreciate and respect the team member's time. So if you're going to be asking somebody to work 12 hours a day and you're not paying them, it's going to be kind of hard, you know, hard pressed to make that happen. In the making of the cube, I made sure the hours are like three hours to four hours because I respected and appreciated the time of the people contributing, uh, the actors, um, when I wasn't able to pay them. So time is something to be cognitive. Oh my God, I can't say that word. I wish I could. Cognitive. No. <laughs> Uh, scratch that. Somebody whoop, whoop, wipe, wipe that out. Being mindful of the time, being mindful of your team's time. Then there's purpose. Is the purpose of the film in alignment with the values and the ideals of your team members? Are they, are they totally into what you're making? If you're making like a Star Wars fan film and they're just somebody who just wants to be part of a film where they can wear their costumes... That is purpose that has alignment, you know, but if you're trying to make a Star Wars fan film and you hired a bunch of uh, film crew guys that were all Star Trek fans, maybe they're not into it, you know, that kind of thing. You just need to know who you're bringing on to your team. Are they in alignment with the purpose? Then growth and growth and deferments like payment deferments. Is this real? Like is the opportunity you're offering, will they grow? Will they increase? improve on their their skill set will they have an opportunity if they're actors to do a role that they don't get a chance to normally do um is this the first time a camera operator gets a chance to be a dp or a sound guy you know gets to do everything where he where he just has an opportunity to be a sound mix or maybe that's what he wants to do instead of just holding a boom mic then when it comes time to celebrate wins do you are you generally celebrating their wins? You know, is there something you're doing that is definitely appreciating what they're doing, and um, having something tangible for them to be like hang their hat on? Like, oh, that's cool. That's, that's a, it was a cool gesture that the team leader has shown to everyone else in the crew. But most important, when you have no money, is just clear communications of making sure that everyone understands what's expected of them. And they have to make that decision themselves of like, okay, I'm going to commit X amount of time for free, but I'm going to get this value out of it. I'm going to get growth. I'm going to get deferment, or I'm totally in alignment with the purpose of this project. Um, and maybe the last thing is they like you. They just want to do it for you. You'd be surprised if you're a good person. Sometimes people just show up because they just want to help you out if they believe in you, you as a leader. 
So those are the types of things you can do when you have no money and you're trying to find good people that won't stab you in the back. Again, you do the 48 hour you know film festival test to see whether or not you know something's shady. And if there's something shady, don't ask them on a bigger project. But if you have the bigger project in place, don't abuse your team members' time if you don't have any money to pay for it, pay them, you know? So that is you holding up your end of the bargain, showing respect and appreciation as a good leader, as a good manager, as a good producer, and so on. So that's it. According to the Film Trooper survey, these three topics, time, fan base, and good people, or finding good people to work with, were the burning questions that the community wanted to know more about. But all this information is essentially useless if you don't apply it. And I've always loved this quote from Bruce Lee. Knowing is not enough. You must apply. Uh, that is my best Bruce Lee impersonation, borderline uh, racist. But anyhow, you get the idea. Knowing is not enough. You must apply. So how do you apply all this information? Is it just self-discipline and willpower? Those things are great factors, but a lot of times they're not sustainable. So you need accountability. So the first time ever I'm going to be launching a Film Trooper Accountability Academy to help you know solve this problem. So for any of those members out there that's like, yeah, I just need somebody to be there, to have an accountability person to be there, to help me move forward through my you know, my goals and my dreams. And so now I think I can offer that to you guys, to the community. However, it's only open to 20 spots because I need to keep it small and lean and be able to give as much value to the initial group that jumps in. If you want to start off your 2016 with a bang, then maybe this Accountability Academy is what you need. If you want to learn more about it, just head on over to filmtrooper.com forward slash academy. Again, that's filmtrooper.com forward slash academy. Again, knowing is not enough. We must apply. We must apply the knowledge that we attain and so that we can make, you know, progress towards our goals and our dreams. So I'm really excited to offer this opportunity to the Film Trooper community. And um, it's my way of celebrating the 100th episode. Like this is, you know, I wanted to make a milestone. This is like 100 episodes. What can we do to take Film Trooper to the next level? And I think this accountability membership, this academy is something that can be very helpful. So thanks so much for all the support every one of you have shown me over the years and uh, to help me get to this 100th episode. And if you're interested in joining the accountability program, then please just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash academy and get all the details. Thanks so much, and I will catch you next time on the Film Trooper podcast and the Film Marketing Fridays video sessions in the very near future.